the the battle of uh, Quito Quanavali was really uh, one of of many contests um, in the final couple of years of the uh, regional diplomacy that uh, that I was involved in as far as the Reagan administration is concerned. Um, I think it's fair to say that the the battle of Quito Quanavali is 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 um, exaggerated in its significance. It is a, if you like, a benchmark, uh, but it was uh, one of many. The, there was a more significant uh, battle that took place, but it was again a kind of symbolic battle in southwestern Angola, whereas Guido Guanavali is in southeastern Angola, um, in an area right along the Namibian border, um, where there was a hydroelectric facility, um, and there was quite a significant um, contest between Cuban and South African forces and each side bloodied each other a little bit in that battle in June of, um, of uh, 1988. But to go back to Quito Quanavali, um, I would describe this as a case where the, the Cubans decided to convert uh, an Angolan military defeat into a Cuban political victory. Uh, to go back to 1987, the, uh, <coughs> the, the contest uh, in, south, in southeastern Angola was one that uh, pitted South African-assisted UNITA forces against the forces of the Angolan army called FAPLA, uh, supported uh, at a distance by the Cubans and, of course, also by the Soviets. The, the Cubans uh, found themselves in a position where they were not really relevant uh, in southeastern Angola until the South Africans pushed all the way up to Quito Quanavali. And the Cubans made a decision, a strategic decision, which I've described in some detail <coughs> in, my, in my book, High Noon in Southern Africa, Making Peace in a Rough Neighborhood. Um, the Cubans had to make a decision. Were they going to sit back and let the Soviets lead this uh, military campaign? Um, were the Soviets going to be the principal advisors to the Angolan government, the MPLA government, in the battle against UNITA forces, or would the Cubans step forward and try and, and deal with uh, what was in fact a growing threat? The South African UNITA forces uh, made a major incursion uh, up in that part uh, of Angola and were approaching uh, the area of Quito Quanaval. And, and so <coughs> I think um, uh, Fidel Castro had a decision to make, and the decision he made, uh, looking back with hindsight, was to raise the ante militarily in order to arrange a negotiated political exit that he could claim was a, a victory. Um, and so what actually took place at Quito Quanavale has often been, I think, quite exaggerated and distorted. The South Africans were there with their world-class artillery. The Cubans moved south to reinforce the position of FAPLA, and there was a standoff. There were several uh, months, in fact, nine months of standoff between the forces uh, of the Cubans and Angolans on one side and the South Africans and UNITA on the other side. Nine months of standoff. Very few casualties, actually, and both sides uh, were feeling each other out. But in the meantime, what Castro did was to increase his military uh, deployments in Angola quite substantially. And I'm talking now in the period between December of 1987 and roughly May, June of 1988. Castro increased the size of the Cuban force in Angola to close to 50,000, an increase of almost 15,000, and brought in some of his best generals and brought in some of his uh, most modern equipment, including um, air defense and, uh, and, and combat aircraft. And where he put those forces was not at Quito Quanavali. Quito Quanavali was uh, a, a symbolic uh, standoff where you had two forces right next to each other, and they didn't actually do that much damage to each other. There weren't that many casualties. But what Castro did was to move that large, significant, increased force that he brought in into southwestern Angola, not southeastern Angola. And he moved it gradually as many as 14,000 men down south towards the Namibian border. This led to a very interesting situation in which it, it might have been possible for this flanking maneuver, if you like, 
uh, to, uh, to cause a real major blow up between the South African forces uh, uh, across the border in, Namib in Angola or the South African forces in Namibia itself and the Cubans coming south. In the end, I, I, I liken it to two scorpions in a bottle trying to have, figure out how to get out of the bottle without stinging each other. And they didn't really do that much damage to each other in southwestern Angola either. Uh, but what this created, and this is where Castro's diplomacy and statecraft, if you like, is quite interesting. What it enabled Castro to claim was that by doing his increased uh, deployments, and by moving forces to the southwest, that he had actually <laughs> had some kind of a major breakthrough and that he had changed the terms of reference and the terms of, uh, of engagement uh, in the Angolan contest. Uh, in fact, what he was looking to do was to use the military moves for political reasons. And Castro was very expert at creating a political narrative surrounding Quito Quanavali as a great breakthrough in the peace process. My view is that, in fact, this was a much, much more complicated contest that involved political elements, psychological elements, and military elements. From the military standpoint, there was a balance between the two forces. South Africans recognized their limits up in Angola and didn't want to have to contest in the air with Cuban MiG-23s and so forth. The, the Cubans also recognized that if they had tried to go south across the Namibian border, they would have had their clocks cleaned. This was not a battle that either side wanted. What they wanted was to figure out how to translate some measure of equivalence back to the negotiating table. And it was the negotiations, of course, that ended, uh, that ended this, uh, this struggle. Uh, but there was a very interesting relationship, and I'll stop my answer here, between the politics, the diplomacy, the psychology, and the military factors that were at play. Nobody really won at Quito Quanaval, and nobody really won at, uh, at Calouac and Techepe and, and along the Angolan border where the Angolan Namibia border where the hydroelectric facilities were. So it's, it's an interesting story. Um, everyone leaves a conflict like the Angolan conflict uh, feeling that they have, have won. Uh, I think uh, you, you want to leave the conference table having achieved peace with honor. And at the end of the day, in December of 1988, the South Africans, the Angolans, and the Cubans, I think all believed that they had achieved something with honor. The effort to have a debate about the significance of Quito Quanavali reflects <clears throat> the considerable skill that I attribute to Fidel Castro in using military moves that did not lead to major combat, but using them for political purposes. What Castro wanted was to take over the conduct of that side of the diplomacy from Moscow, which in his view was not, was not all that skillful in managing uh, an African counterinsurgency war. I, I didn't make this up. I've heard it from Castro himself, that he, he felt that the Soviets didn't know what they were doing in some respects, and that, the, uh, that he understood better than the Soviets what should be done. So I think we have to give uh, Castro considerable uh, credit for understanding the politics of war. And that's why the narrative about Quito has been, has been carried as long as it has. It's become a kind of modern mythology. The reality is what Castro wanted was to get out of Angola. He wanted to get out of Southern Africa. He wanted to, but it, but to do so in a way that would enable him to say for the rest of time, and the Cubans have said this for the rest of time, that uh, he made a contribution to peace in, in Southern Africa, as indeed I think he did. So the question that's uh, on the minds of people who were attending this event uh, at Chatham House uh, <laughs> Uh, is there a lasting legacy of Quito Quanaval? Uh, I think I would have to say two things. There are lots of people writing their history books. Um, I've written mine. I don't see Quito Quanaval as a decisive event. I see it as one in a series of events, uh, both military and political events. The real legacy uh, from this time period is the uh, New York Accords of December 22, 1988 which ended the regional wars in Southern Africa, a time when, you know, for you could really say we were turning a page. 
turning a page away from military solutions and toward political solutions, a time when, for the first time in many, many years, you saw foreign armies go home. South Africans left Namibia, South Africans left Angola, South Africans pulled back from their cross-border uh, harassing of Mozambique, um, Cubans progressively left Angola, and, and so for the first time in many years, foreign armies went home. And that's all attributable to the diplomacy, the statecraft, um, and the various moves that different parties made in 1987 and 88.